Good evening, welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us for tonight's education session on COVID-19 infection control, PPE, and respiratory presentations. My name is Charles Broadfoot, and I'm one of the professional development and professional development officers with Hunter New England Central Coast Primary Health Network. And I would firstly like to acknowledge the First Peoples and traditional custodians of all the lands in which we are meeting on tonight and pay my respects to elders past, present and those emerging. Tonight's session is being recorded and the recording and slides will become available from tomorrow morning in our PHN Education Library. So to access the library, this is on our website, just head to the phn.com.au and click on the Education tab. There will be a short evaluation survey that will pop up when the webinar ends. If you could just take a moment to fill that out before you log off, that would be great. We really appreciate your feedback. So you can type questions in this evening in the questions pane in your control panel. So please type your questions throughout the presentations. We have allocated time after the main presentations to go through these questions with our panel of speakers. I would now like to introduce John Bailey. John is the Executive Manager for Primary Care Improvement with the PHN, and John will introduce tonight's speakers and panellists. So over to you. Thanks, John. Thanks, Charles, and uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, on this uh, evening and uh, for our session. Tonight, we'll be discussing a range of uh, topics, including how to triage patients and what questions to ask, strategies for the waiting room, PPE, how to see respiratory patients, sharing tips and uh, tricks around uh, managing uh, when doctors are in self-isolation. Tonight, we've got uh, Dr. John Ferguson uh, from Hunt New England Local Health District to give us some information on infection, infection control and epidemiology. Uh, Dr. Michelle Redford, who's a general practitioner here in Newcastle at Black Buck Doctors. Dr. Joanne Wood, who's a GP and clinical director with Hunter Primary Care. Uh, Dr. Colin Pierce, who's a GP here in the Hunter. And uh, Michelle Redford. So thank you everyone. And over to you, John Ferguson. Right, thanks very much, John. And I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands we're meeting on, the Wobbegal people. Pay my respects to elders past and present. Uh, and I'd, I guess I'd also like to acknowledge the hard work that all the, all the folk in general practice are doing at the moment, rolling out vaccination and dealing with the general public's uh, um, issues around COVID-19. So it's been a long time since I went to one of these meetings, thankfully, and hopefully we are getting things back in the bag. Uh, I know that our public health guys are working overtime as we speak, and um, I'm reasonably optimistic we'll get this under control. Um, for my sins, I've been co-chairing the National Evidence Co COVID Evidence Task Force Infection Control Panel that was set up last November and I've remained a member of the Infection Control Expert Group of the Commonwealth. So I can give you some insights into what's been going on. So we're dealing with a, an outbreak, and I've got some slides lifted from CDC here, of a, a variant that is far more transmissible than we've seen before. And this slide attempts to compare, contrast the different uh, transmissibility potential of, of the strain so far. So the ancestral strain to the left there and the Delta variant really on par with chickenpox in terms of its transmissibility and more, um, possibly more pathogenic than um, the ancestral strain. Um, so we're seeing um, infections with a much higher viral load and duration of shedding. So this, this is evidence from India where um, the Delta, the CT cycle threshold values had a mean of uh, 16.5 in that particular study uh, compared to mean of, C, uh, of 19. So the lower that value, the higher the viral load, with about a tenfold increase as that CT changes by three. And uh, you know, more usually we've been seeing CT values in the 20s with the original strain. We see longer duration of, of high CT of low CT values up to 30, 18 days with the Delta infection. And the risk of reinfection may be higher compared to the alpha variant, 
which um, uh, this UK strain previously called um, the viral load that we're seeing in vaccinated versus unvaccinated cases uh, may be just as transmissible in the vaccine bait breakthrough cases. So there's data showing uh, um, from Massachusetts there, no difference in mean CT values in vaccinated and unvaccinated cases. So that's quite scary. Um, and um, with higher viral loads in Delta like breakthroughs. The disease itself can be uh, more severe. So there's increased risk of hospitalization and death in, in Canada and in Singapore, increased risk of oxygen requirement, ICU admission and pneumonia, higher odds of hospitalization in Scotland. So in, in summary, high transmissibility, possibly because of higher viral load um, and more prolonged excretion. And there's been evidence of transmission during fairly fleeting contact in Australia and um, likely more severe disease, but we are seeing more patients in ICU in their 20s in this current outbreak. Breakthrough infections may be as transmissible as unvaccinated cases. Now the vaccines are presenting, are thought to prevent, both Pfizer and AstraZeneca prevent the majority of severe disease, but they may be less effective at reducing, at preventing infection and transmission. So more breakthrough and more possible community spread. Uh, risk of severe disease or death reduced tenfold by, in vaccinated patients and risk of infection reduced threefold. So that's just put the death Delta variant aside, but Delta and Alpha particularly set uh, the um, evidence panel thinking further about re-evaluating the evidence and, and the COVID task force went over all the studies, about 16 um, studies looking at masks versus respirators and looking at the effect of eye protection uh, for preventing COVID. And uh, really it came down to a decision that um, acknowledged the role of airborne transmission, so transmission of smaller particles, um, possibly at close distances and also possibly longer distances. And once that recognition was there, it really leads you inexorably to a requirement to use higher grade of respiratory protection, i.e. respirators, P2N95 respirators, which are far more efficient at filtering out fine particles than surgical masks. And if properly fitted, don't have the gaps around them to allow um, aerosols to transmit. And as part of the evidence review, we acknowledge the high viral load found in fine particle fractions. We acknowledge that even larger particles up to 100 microns can move in air currents quite long distances and can desiccate out in low humidity environments down to finer particles. So that there's, there's not just the close contact risk that occurs with COVID, it can potentially occur at distance dependent on air flows, directed air flows. Uh, so we'll just briefly reference some of the infection prevention controls. We've got standard precautions, of course. Immunization we've, we're not going to address tonight. Engineering controls we'll mention, administrative controls, and then of course personal protective equipment. So there is a wider document here, hierarchy of controls that the infection control expert group produced that you can access. So engineering questions or, or recommendations uh, come down to maximizing fresh air ventilation. And that's often about finding out what level of ventilation is within your surgeries or rooms. There are proxies that you can use like um, CO2 levels uh, can be measured and can indirect, indirectly be associated with the ventilation frequency of that area. Dependent on what we know about the ventilation, we may need to spell areas between patients to allow aerosols to be cleared by the ventilation. ventilation. Uh, we want to avoid directed air flows out of zone. We want to provide negative flow rooms where possible to isolate high risk patients. Um, and so that's been engineered into acute care as much as we can. 
reduce the airborne load at the source. So I'll mention that in the next slide uh, uh, with air filtration. And controls of temperature and humidity are important. Um, so viruses will do better, uh, will transmit further in low humidity environments, and, um, but conversely, their viability goes down. So there's an interaction between humidity and temperature and viability and transmissible, transmissibility. So aerosol load reduction is the latest cab off the rank role for air, mobile air cleaning cleaners. I'm picturing one device there. They generally have HEPA filtration within them. And this particular one is able to process something like 700 litres per hour. And they've been shown in this study, with two studies from Melbourne, to be very effective at clearing aerosols. What they've generally used is a smoke aerosol on micron smoke particles and the clearance time for such um, particles is far quicker than just using the um, ventilation alone from the air conditioning. So they're, they're relatively low cost, low maintenance and I think they've got scope in general practice perhaps for waiting rooms um, and definitely for smaller rooms where respiratory patients are being evaluated. Administrative controls, I think these remain amongst the most important and I, I'm sure that all of you are very good practice managers who organise your care and um, have consistent implementation of practices, um, which we need to audit from time to time. Uh, we need to have good surveillance of acute respiratory infection in our staff and patients um, and um, we need all of our staff to know the importance of seeking medical care and getting tested early in the, in the instance of illness. Eye protection remains important. So the evidence level here from the panel was not sufficient to provide evidence-based recommendations. Uh, consensus recommendation was made. The evidence couldn't distinguish between the effect of goggles versus um, wraparound glasses, but there was a definite effect seen in the um, fairly low value studies that were, were available for review. There were about six studies. And some um, useful eye protection practice points are in this document reference there. So I commend that to you. What about surgical masks? Will they remain important for source control? They also still provide some wearer protection. Um, remember that they are validated down to one micron particles of stack. So they do filter out um, fine aerosols, but they have gaps around them. So they're not nearly as protective as P2 masks. Um, but source control, very important. Um, we, we can show that uh, viruses, bacteria are, are trapped very effectively by surgical masks. And this has been validated with hamster model, uh, poor hamsters. And there's no, no real uh, advantage of a P2 respirator for source control, so we don't recommend that. What about respirators? Excuse me, sorry. Uh, so respirators have a far higher fit factor, which is the ability to reduce aerosol inhalation. So that's measured quantitatively during a fit test with a saline aerosol and there's a detector within the mask, a detector outside the mask, and you look at the proportion of particles that are trapped by the mask, and that is generally the fit factors are more than tenfold greater for a, a P2 mask, a well-fitted P2 mask versus a surgical mask. And so the Living Evidence Task Force Review, the panel came down to say that um, uh, the evidence was uncertain, um, so there wasn't an ability to make a recommendation, but we uh, did think it was strong enough to come up with a consensus recommendation. Uh, so that was to use P2 N95 respirators rather than surgical masks uh, for care of COVID patients or patients with high risk um, suspect COVID, which are basically patients with ARI and presence of epidemiological factors. So of course, once we have sustained community transmission, which we don't yet have, but could well have in the future, uh, all patients with ARI become 
suspect um, to be ruled out by testing. And so um, what happens in practice and what's happening in our EDs at the moment is that they have adopted uh, routine airborne precautions for all patients in the ED zone because um, we can't be trapped by an unexpected case coming through and exposing um, X number of staff within that zone. So close contacts, but as specified by Population Health, these are people that have had exposure. They remain suspect cases for 14 days, whatever test results are. Why fit test? So fit testing improves the fit factor of P2 masks. And so we do try to get everybody fit tested. However, even a fit checked with respirator that's not fit tested provides superior uh, protection to a surgical mask. And I guess in, in the knowledge that nearly all of us healthcare workers are now vaccinated against COVID, um, I think uh, that is providing us with quite a safety factor as well. Um, and so I certainly think that uh, if you can fit check a respirator well, that is satisfactory to me for COVID care. Uh, being vaccinated is even more important. The advantage is we get good instruction during a fit test about how to mask, how to mold the mask and don it properly. And you can really see the dynamic effect of that molding on, on the fit check machine, fit test machine. And so that does provide better assurance to staff. Uh, so we have had issues with a number of different faces and respiratory respirator types available. And um, we have trouble with staff getting pressure sores uh, from the mask over the nose. And so I would counsel that you use some sort of moisturizer cream to the nose regularly, uh, particularly before you put the mask on, the respirator on, and also before you shower to protect that damaged skin from hot water. Don't use any soap on the face. So that's what I've got to present. I'm hoping we get lots of questions. We can explore a few things. Uh, that's the website for the Evidence Task Force. So you can di di dive into the evidence. Very good living guidelines around clinical management of COVID-19 as well. Thanks very much. Thanks, John. And uh, I'd encourage you, if you are listening, to please put your questions into the question panel so that we can have those answered and they'll be available uh, in the summary. I'd now like to hand over to Lee Fong. And my apologies, Lee, I didn't introduce you earlier. But if I can introduce Lee Fong and Colin Pierce, who are now going to uh, answer some questions and talk through some of the issues in primary care. Thanks, Lee. Thanks, Colin. Um, what, uh, hi, it's uh, Lee here. Um, what, uh, what Colin and I might do is just let you know about a couple of scenarios that have arisen within um, some primary care contexts um, as a subject to provoke some thought. Sorry, webcam's up now. <laughs> Uh, as uh, to provoke some thought and discussion, which will then lead into um, Michelle um, telling us maybe how we could have avoided the situations we found ourselves in. So Colin, um, could I ask you to uh, tell us about your particular experience last week? Sure, well, um, I was in a um, operating theatre last week on Friday and got a text from our practice manager saying that we had all been uh, casual contacts and we all required to be tested and self-isolate. Um, that had happened in the context of a vaccination clinic. We have all hands on deck at our vaccination clinics. Um, we do about 150 people an hour uh, and it takes about 20 staff in order to do that. They're about 18 to 20 staff. We all were wearing masks. The exposure occurred on the Thursday before last Thursday, so about 10 days, uh, 10 days ago or so, 12, 11 days. Um, someone was in Charlestown Square with COVID and one of our patients had a casual contact with that person. And that casual contact then came to our vaccination clinic and was seen. So eight days after that was when we got notification, firstly from GPT, which is the centre uh, management, and 
further to that, there were discussions with public the public health unit. And it was decided that we didn't have to, I wasn't privy to those discussions that happened with IPN uh, in the public health unit, but it was decided that anyone that was there, um, despite wearing surgical masks, would need to uh, be tested and um, isolate until negative. Um, and effectively that meant we were unable to open. So we, we canceled our Saturday and Sunday clinics. Um, I went in and tested everyone because at that point it had been announced in Newcastle and all of the drive-through clinics were six hours uh, wait thereabouts. And so we sent the tests away, we marked them all urgent. He brought up another issue is it took us, some for some people 48 or more hours to come back. Most of us got our result within about 24 to 30 hours. Um, so that, that was our scenario. We were the casual, a casual contact of a casual contact on the same day. And I think it's encouraging that um, public health are really trying to put this back in the box and, and IPN as well. And this was may, maybe an overreaction. And at that point, it was very new in Newcastle. And hopefully that's not the case at the moment. And certainly it's changed our practice as to how we're doing the vaccination clinics. And another thing that I could perhaps talk about later is how, how our practice of doing respiratory clinics has changed in, in terms of PPE. So that, that's the scenario, and I hope that's put that in a way that everyone understands. Thank you very much for that, Colin. Um, so I might recount a well somewhat similar experience to that we had at GP Access After Hours. Most people would be aware of the uh, positive case that was at the John Hunter Emergency Department last Thursday night. Now, the GP access after hours clinic is you know, just across the corridor. Um, there, was, there were patients in the John Hunter ED who were classified as close contacts, I presume, of that positive patient who was waiting in the ED. And one or two of those patients were transferred over to GP access after hours. Now, I was asked about whether this was an issue um, by uh, one of our clinic managers. And my instant reaction was, no, it's not a problem because if someone is a close contact and they are exposed for minutes or hours, my assumption would be that they might've been infected, but not infectious. Um, and so by the time they came over to us, and even if they've been in the waiting room for a while and seen doctors, seen the nurse, seen the admin staff, I didn't think that was an infection risk, that there, there would be a risk of transmission. As it turned out, I was wrong, um, at least not in the way that it was um, actioned. We were informed by public health that the GP and the admin officer, um, who had not gone over to the ED that night, uh, but who had had contact with the close contact, um, were classified essentially as casual contacts. Um, now, part of the issue there may have been the PPE that they were wearing or the lack of it. So for example, I know that the GP was wearing a surgical mask, um, was also wearing his own prescription eyewear, but not formal eye protection. And so as the close contact of a close contact, so a secondary contact, it appears to be enough to have made him a casual contact, which meant that, the, that he had to get tested and remain in isolation until that test came back negative. So that told me very quickly that in, and I didn't think this was the case, that it appeared to be in a secondary transmission risk scenario that there was a serious business continuity issue uh, at stake here in terms of us to be able to continue to provide an important service to the community, as well as opening my eyes to a risk to staff that I hadn't really appreciated before as well. So that's a couple of things in many ways echoing what happened to Colin Pierce. So to explore that a little bit further now, um, I might hand over to Michelle. Thanks, Lee. That's great. I'm just um, going to start sharing my screen in just a second. Let's do that and hopefully that is working. 
Yes, yeah, so thanks everybody. Thanks to the PHN and thanks um, to all the presenters for bringing this together at extremely short notice after um, a few of us from HGPA got together at the weekend and virtually, I have to say, virtually got together at the weekend and realised that we were, that there was maybe a bit of a gap in what we were, what we were doing as a result of um, these couple of incidents that Colin and Lee have explained. So I'm going to talk through a little bit of um, how I've been managed, I've, I've, things I've put together to help manage the risk um, at our practice. And I have to say at the beginning, I am not a public health expert, public health trained, or even a practice owner or anything like that. So I am happy to take questions. I'll do, do my best to answer them. But um, I am um, not necessarily, you know, I'm a, a keen amateur is how I'm describing myself. So I think Lee makes a really important point about business continuity. And I think we, we really are key workers at the moment. We're rolling out the vaccine. We are seeing people with respiratory presentations and we need to keep going. So um, these are the sorts of things that we're going to just talk about. So we're going to be talking about, again, about the hierarchy of controls. So that's just really echoing what John said but just putting it more into a general practice um, context and then um, some more stuff about PPE and then um, some considerations about seeing respiratory patients. So hopefully that is all clear and makes sense. So, so just going through what we're going to talk about. So what PPE do we need? And I think the key thing about that is that it's role and risk dependent. So what somebody needs at reception might be different to what somebody needs if they're seeing patients face to face. And that might be different to what somebody needs if they're seeing respiratory patients. Some stuff about triaging and separating out respiratory patients. Some stuff about minimizing risks in the waiting room. And if we get there at the end, some little tips about working from home. And I think the thing about that is that at some point, a lot of us are going to end up in self-isolation and having to work from home for one reason or another if it hasn't already happened. It certainly has already happened to me and I've done telehealth from home on a few separate occasions. But um, I think just getting set up for that in advance makes it much less stressful. So this document just has come out fairly recently from New South Wales Health and this is the guidance framework for public health this is my understanding anyway, that, that for public health, when they're assessing an exposure. So I know it's probably coming up pretty tiny on your screens, but it's, it, demonst it demonstrates the different levels of PPE and that can be worn both by the clinician and, and by the case and the levels of contact between the clinician and the case. Well, it doesn't have to be the clinician, but um, any member of staff, any staff member. So the staff member in the case, what that contact was, and then how the risk is likely to be assessed. And I think some key things, and we can share this slides later and you can zoom in and you can see in more detail. Um, but the key things to note about this are that you can make quite a difference to your assessed um, risk level by having, having patients wear surgical masks, number one, and wearing proper eye protection, number two. And so I think there's lots of focus a lot of the time on surgical masks and P2N95s and fit testing and fit checking and all these things. And these are all really important as well. But these two things are actually really quite relatively easy to implement, you know, compared to fit testing every single person, you know, who works in healthcare and actually have a big impact. So that's just to share that really. And then this is this is probably all familiar. These are probably very familiar graphics. These are the New South Wales Health um, Guide to Different Levels of Precaution, Contact Precautions, Droplet Precautions. So, so PPE, so get your eye protection sorted. I don't know if everybody has got eye protection. I brought mine so I could show people. So I've got my beautiful safety glasses, which have um, had a very good workout since the beginning of the pandemic. So then proper safety glasses, they're not just prescription glasses. You can't just use prescription glasses, that does not count. And I've also got this delight from Bunnings, which hopefully you can see okay. Um, 
it's got my name on it. And um, it's not very comfortable for prolonged wear, but it's okay. And um, that would also work. Um, screens at reception, I don't think they count. I don't know if John wants to come in on that. John Ferguson. Are you still there? I might ask him at the end. Yes, no, I am. Um, uh, yeah, look, I think they make make sense, uh, definitely. But would they allow the receptionist not to have eye protection? Uh, it's uncertain. I, I, I think it's... Um, I Look, I don't think we should say it's a substitute for eye protection. I think anybody yeah. in, the, in the surgery should really be using eye protection in, in this okay. kind of area. Yeah, thank you. That's helpful. Yeah, so I think um, I think you know that I've had a few questions like that about screens, and if you've got a screen up, then maybe that counts. But you know, that's the bottom line is everyone should have eye protection. So good. Um, never forgetting the importance of hand hygiene and all our um, everyone surely knows how to do these things now. But um, it's always good to have a reminder about donning and doffing. And um, John's provided that link at the bottom there, which is the YouTube video, which just takes us through it again. And actually, sometimes it is good to just have a refresh, isn't it? Um, so Peter and N95, as John said, and so respiratory presentations in the current environment require P2 N95 um, airway protection for anyone that's exposed to respiratory presentations. So um, fit testing and checking is still a hot topic. And John Bailey from the PHN is trying to do some work on that and trying to um, find out whether there's something that's going to be more available for GPs, because I know that is a concern amongst the GPs that I've had conversations with. Um, but that's kind of in progress. And I suppose the other thing is just extended use of PPE. So that all comes together in this, which some of you may have seen versions of this already because it has been kicking around for a while, but this is my latest version after I've had the chance to pick John Ferguson's brain, which was fantastic. So um, this helps us to decide what level of um, PPE different people doing different jobs in primary care use in different levels of community transmission risk. So um, this isn't exactly the version that we use in our practice, and I'll tell you what, I'll take you through in a second. But you can see we're currently red, we're on red alert, and so um, people working in vaccination clinics where you have a lot of contact with a lot of people, and also where um, the threat to service if a load of you become close contacts and all have to self-isolate for 14 days is pretty significant. Those people are, are supposed to be wearing um, proper P2, N95 um, respirators and eye protection. And then you can go down all the way down. So, so non-clinical staff who um, maybe have some minimal contact with the public, you know, they still need to have protection because some of the, those patients may not yet be screened. And then people who are in back office, you know, they, they um, just maybe need to be having um, just a surgical mask. And then down the bottom, so clinical staff, so, so I've split this into respiratory presentation, patients with respiratory presentations versus patients with no respiratory present, with no respiratory symptoms. And so anyone who's got respiratory symptoms, you're going to need to have P2, N95 respirator and eye protection. If you've got no respiratory symptoms and you have low epidemiological risk, which is difficult to define and tricky, then there is an argument for having a surgical mask and eye protection and not P2 N95. So, which we'll talk about in a minute. So, and then in the blue column at the side, that's all the other rules, isn't it? So that's all the things hopefully we're doing that people are immunized. If you're sick, you stay home. If you cough in the waiting room, you get sent out. Um, that we've got all the bare below the elbow stuff going on and um, the stuff about um, using your um, mask for up to four hours. So hopefully that's all clear. Happy for people to um, take that away. So yes, this is getting back to epidemiological risk. So I think it is really important to triage out respiratory symptoms and see them separately and have a, a work stream for that where they are completely separate from other patients. Um, so that bit is, the, the triaging out of respiratory symptoms is fairly 
straightforward. I have um, put in that sinus thing because, oh my goodness, how many times in the past year and a half has someone said no to any, everything and then been sitting in front of me and said, oh, but I have got a touch of the sinus. So I kind of would like that added to the questions, but it's not an official question, so I've left it out. Um, and we currently have been asking, you know, have you had these in the past three weeks, you know, that it's an acute illness? Um, I haven't seen that really very official anywhere, but um, that's what we've been doing. And a temperature check, which we know, you know, that has limitations, but we're still doing it. And so 37.5 or above fails the temperature check. And then epidemiological risk. And the reason I want to talk about this is because I find this really tricky now because everybody has some level of epidemiological risk currently in Newcastle and most of our area. If you go out to Tamworth and and um, the Central Coast and other places as well, they obviously have epidemiological risk as well. And it's very difficult to gauge, isn't it? Like what level of epidemiological risk will you accept to um, let somebody into your practice to be seen. Um, currently, I would say we're not letting in any if we can possibly help it. And the problem with that is that you don't actually find out they've got an epidemiological risk until about a week later, as has been shown in the cases that Lee and Colin were talking about. So I think we've taken the decision that because we can't really very clearly rely upon epidemiological risk that we're seeing all patients anyone who's face to face we're seeing them with p2n95 because we're struggling to rely on epidemiological risk as a discriminator Hopefully yes, that makes sense I, if, it doesn't, if it doesn't make sense I'll, we can talk about it at the end hmm. so respiratory presentations what, what can we do we can do lots of telehealth and there's actually loads you can do every telehealth isn't there i mean i'm actually quite enjoying doing telehealth at the moment and doing a few video consultations um, so that's one way of assessing people who don't actually have to have their chest listened to, obviously. What we're doing is we have a separate stream, so respiratory presentations have zero access to the waiting room. I know that other people are doing other things, but I'll just very briefly talk about what we're doing. So they book online and they wait in the car and we speak to them on the phone and then if we're going to bring them into the surgery because they have to be examined and we can't sort it out over the phone, then they come straight into the room where the doctor is. The doctor is in their P2N95 eye protection, et cetera, with the window open. And they do what they have to do in the briefest possible of time. And then the patient leaves and they don't have any contact with anybody else in the building. They don't see reception. It's all done remotely. Um, and then, you know, everything has to be wiped down, et cetera. So like it's time consuming and there's PPE involved and it's um, not, you know, it's not, um, it doesn't always flow very beautifully, but um, it's really important sometimes, isn't it? You have to see these people. We're seeing some really sick people in those clinics. And so I think um, it is important to do it if you can. That's how we're doing it. We don't have an outside space. So I know Colin was saying um, they see people in the car park. And if you can see somebody outside, then of course that's a lower risk and that's great. Um, so I mean, I think that's the other option. Um, but yeah, we're, we are seeing people in the surgery. Um, waiting room, so waiting room um, is a really potential risk area for transmission. And so we limit access to the waiting room. So if you've got respiratory symptoms, you can't be in there. Everybody has to now, we're in red alert, has to wear a surgical mask. So that means that patients that are coming in for whatever reason have to change their cloth masks when they come in, if they're coming wearing a cloth mask. Um, if you cough, you're out, sorry. Um, you know, we can't have people coughing in the waiting room and we're trying to minimize the amount of time people are in there. Of course, they're there for 15 minutes after immunization, but we're trying to um, keep the that kind of waiting times and things down and they we automate what we can so that they're not having direct contact with reception. So that that's all my kind of, sorry, I've gone backwards and forwards a bit there. So that's all the, um, how we run things and then these are just some very quick tips if i've got time to about working from home so i'll just go through very quickly you can probably just read those if i put them up but um a lot of it sounds really obvious but these were the things that drove me completely crazy when i first was working from home and the thing i missed most of all was my work printer 
with its multiple drawers and the ability to just press a button and print a um, pathology um, request form. So these are my tips. Um, I'm happy for you to share them. Um, having a paper shredder as well was very important. I've even got a little sticker on my printer showing me which way around to put the paper in because, you know, it is very frustrating when you've printed that script three times. Anyway, we shouldn't be printing scripts anymore because we have a better solution. So that's just my setup stuff. Again, I'm not an IT person or a practice manager, so I can't help you actually get things set up. But these are this is just the list of things that we've done to make sure that everything works. And actually, I can work from home and do telehealth from home. It's not actually a nightmare anymore. So all of those things, remote access, that TPS print thing, whatever, I can't remember you know, where it comes from, but that allows me just to print normally from home, which is great. And love a bit of secure messaging. If all the specialists could just get onto secure messaging or sent referral, that would be marvelous. Um, we use GP consults for our telehealth and I'm really happy with that, but obviously there are other ones as well. Escripts has been a revolution. And this one probably is my top tip, which is the pathology and radiology templates. I've just got them as um, letter templates in best practice. And it means I can just email them direct to the patient from best practice. Um, I don't have to send anything through to reception or anything like that. So that's good. Um, and then e-paperwork, the delight of e-paperwork. That just tell, that's just a li quick list of um, how we get things places. And other people will have other um other workarounds that maybe you just want to look at the slides later because it's not maybe not that interesting but um if you have questions about that later i'm happy to take them so i think that was as far as i've got so i think we're over to questions Thanks, Michelle. We're going to hand over now to Joe Hanwood, who's going to facilitate the questions. Thanks. We've, uh, we've got a great range of questions that have come through and I have started doing some assigning and I must admit that I don't quite understand how it works. So forgive me, I <laughs> will ask them and assign them as we go. So a lot of the questions hopefully have been answered by your presentation already, Michelle and John. Um, and I see that John's been busily answering a lot of those as we go. Um, so I'm going to pop one to John. Oh, no, yep. John, how about this one? For patients with uh, acute respiratory illness who present wearing a cloth mask, we would prefer them to change to a surgical mask. What is the best way to do this? Should they just pop a surgical mask on over the top to avoid handling the mask or should they swap it completely? Goodness, I, I don't like the idea of double masks. I, I think they should swap it. And then oh, there you hand. go. Yeah. That's, that's a good I mean, tip. Yeah. No, because otherwise I'll take, <laughs> they'll take it off and put it in their pocket and then pull it out when they leave and put it back on their face. Yeah. There's no, no curing grubbiness, is there? <laughs> no, Extra that's not good. Um, there's a lot of questions here around fit testing. Uh, John Bailey, did you want to have a quick chat about that? I mean, it's, it's one of those things that we have been struggling to sort of deal with in general practice for a while. Yeah, look, it, it's been a vexed issue and one that we've been struggling to get traction on. Um, I have today, again, made some inquiries about either rental of or purchase of fit testing equipment for our the primary care network. Uh, I'll follow that up over the next week and we will um, see if we can do something with it. Well, that sounds great and a bit more promising. Um, Michelle, I've assigned some of these to you, but feel free to bounce them straight to, to John if, you, if you're if you struggling with them. I feel like this is something that you have answered in your presentation, but I'm going to bring it up. It's from Simon Morgan. Hi, Simon. Is it necessary or appropriate to use N95s for non-ARI patients face-to-face? -face? I mean, that is the key question, Simon, isn't it, really? Um, so that, I think, comes down to epidemiological risk, which we could probably argue about all night, you know? So I think it comes down to how what your appetite is 
for risk really in your practice. We've certainly taken the decision that we don't want to all become close contacts and have to self-isolate for any longer than is absolutely strictly necessary. And so we've taken the decision that we are all, so nurses and doctors all using P2N95s for all face-to-face -face in red alert. So, but as John has, um, pointed out quite rightly, you could take the other view and you could use surgical masks and eye protection um, for non-ARI presentations. So does that make sense? I guess does that I answer mean, the question? Could I butt in? It's just very difficult, isn't it, to wear a P2 mask all day. Um, you, you come away with terrible nose, uh, nose pressure. It, it, it is, and I'm the living proof of that. And um, but um, I suppose we try and batch things as much as we can. So part of that is, so for example, I did a whole day in general practice yesterday, and I only saw one person face to face, and I did the rest of it in telehealth because I wasn't on our infectious symptoms clinic. So we do infectious symptoms clinic sessionally. So if it runs for about four hours, and you're in your full PPE for that. But when I'm on telehealth, I'm not. You know, I'm wearing a surgical mask. So um, I'm not seeing people face to face. So, so I would encourage you to try and organize your day so that you're not having to wear P2 all day because it's hard going. But um, you know, people will come up with different solutions for that. We're just trying to um, support mm. them to find their own solutions. I think the other part of that is that your, um, your risk can come from your staff themselves. So it's very easy. You don't have to do the wrong thing. You can very easily, become a close contact, you know, whether it's within your household with someone, you know, a child, your essential worker, your child's going to school, they come back, you're a close contact, whatever, or you've been to Coles and you've become a contact that way. So it's very easy to um, then find out five days later that you've been working since a close contact. So, you know, if you're in, if you're in decent respiratory protection, then hopefully that is, a, is something that public health will take into account when they're deciding, you know, what needs to happen. I might I might butt in there and say that um, that's the approach that we're taking at GP Access After Hours at this point in time, where we're saying that the GP, the registered nurse, and the um, admin officer um, are wearing. You know, the biggest emphasis I think has to be on the eye protection, and that's something that's really been massively highlighted for me over the last few days. I have been super slack with eye protection completely super slack um, but as of this weekend <laughs> as of this weekend these are staying on my face and they are not coming off i was thinking you know should i have a surgical implant or something just to drill them into the side of my head i'm keeping yeah. these things on the secondary issue about um, surgical versus uh, p2n95 i mean i have actually written to the public health unit and said um, given the scenario that we face in gp access after hours where we had somebody who wasn't, you know, an, a confirmed case, but a, a you know, a, a close contact who came through the clinic within minutes or hours of their exposure, and that turning our staff into, you know, what appeared to be casual contacts, whether the application of correct eye protection plus a surgical mask would have saved them from that casual contact status. And also, sorry. The P2. Yeah, yeah, sorry. But also, if there's any difference between, you know, would their valuation change whether it was eye protection plus surgical versus eye protection plus unfit tested P2 or eye protection plus fit tested P2? So I'm waiting for an answer on that. Um, but until until then, um, we're just going we're just going the full deal. Go the full Monty. Well, is that the right word? It's going the opposite way. <laughs> The unfull Monty, <laughs> the unfull Monty, um, because it is a major risk for business continuity. Mm, I mean, I think I might jump in there because we, we were a casual contact of a casual contact in surgical masks. And when you have high throughput, as we do in those clinics, I, you, I don't think we have an option if you want continuity of business to, to do anything except wear um, a P2 mask with, with all patient contact. So I think Colin, there is a question here specifically for you. How did you change the vaccination clinic after your casual contact incident? Have you guys, like your change has been? Yes, our change has been that everyone wears 
uh, appropriate PPE. We all wear eye protection now. I haven't done one since. Um, I was I was off over the weekend, so I had a long weekend. But um, P2 or N95 masks and eye protection, and uh, that that's the case with any patient contact. And with the respiratory clinics, which we do in the car park, we also uh, put on a gown and and one of those lovely green face shields. Great. So I'm just having a quick look through our questions here. We do have quite a few. Um, John, I'm apologies if you have covered this. Do we still do temperature checks? Is it you know, is it a worthwhile thing to be doing? No. As part of a screening. No. Uh, I think it's been studied and shown to be very poorly sensitive and very non-specific. It doesn't add anything. We stopped doing that for the hospital entry some, oh, probably about a month ago. Well, that's marvellous. I'll be able to stop. <laughs> it's yeah. wonderful. It's still on the New South Wales Health um, what to do at the door of a hospital um, website. Really? Yeah. Because I did look before when I made the presentation. <laughs> well, there's parts of New South Wales Health that don't know what the other parts are saying, I think. <laughs> right. Okay. We, well, we, found, uh, we, we found can take today, your word for it and we'll take we'll get rid of the temperature checks. <laughs> an example today, we found that the New South Wales locations of interest for COVID, you have to look in two places. There's one on the education site for the schools and one on the New South Wales Health for everywhere else. And they don't cross-reference each other. So. Oh, you're joking. Yes, well, I haven't been using that in my epidemiological risk assessment either. So we haven't been we haven't been accessing the Department of Education list for schools as yes, part so of the epidemiological big. risk. Yeah. That's a new one. <laughs> Thank you, John. That yeah. was a a fascinating bit of information. <laughs> um John, this is a question for you as well. We have a, um, a GP who works in a smaller emergency department setting, and I think he's asking some questions about trying to manage acute respiratory illnesses when you don't have the spaces to do it. Um, so he's saying, can open plan, i.e. not single room emergency departments in the Peel River District, small hospitals, manage acute respiratory illness presentations if, a thought, if they are thought to need assessment and treatment? Is there any sort of set number of meters from a patient where this situation would be acceptable? What about single rooms without ventilation? Could you use the ambulance bay? Uh, yes, so the smaller, these are really problematic environments if you're looking at potential airborne spread. And um, we previously sort of said a three meter uh, virtual zone around the person. Um, there is scope to use air filtration, mobile air filtration to act as like a virtual barrier, but they provide a sort of an air curtain effect that um, swallows up any aerosol and prevents it moving beyond that curtain. And that's that's sort of well shown, particularly with the larger devices. So that, that would be one way to create a, a more secure barrier. The other thing would be to put to to use whatever single room there is and use the filtration within the room. Um, uh, even then with a positive pressure room, you might find that the load getting out of the room is much lower if there's a filter. These filters are very efficient at removing aerosol. So be creative. Yeah. 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 Um, another mask question, um, which I think is worth sort of digging deep into just to myth bust with masks is there any benefit from double masking if you only have surgical masks available no definitely not it doesn't improve the fit the, the main problem with surgical masks is that they don't fit the face properly and there's you know you, you get movement of air around the edges of the mask um, it's not it's, the mask material is very efficient it's, it's not as efficient as p2 respirator but it still works very well. So double masking doesn't work. Um, I'm just thinking there's, a, I'm seeing a lot of double up with the questions that we've covered already. And I think we've got another five minutes. Is that right, John, Bailey? Yep. Um, 
I've got a question for you, John, Ooh. if no one else has got one. Um, when it comes to the air, fil air filters, which I'm really not familiar with, particularly if we're using them in, you know, sort of in an infection control, as an infection control measure, is there a suggestion about how often the filters should be changed? Uh, yes, yeah, so, so the filters get changed about every 12 months in the one the devices I've seen, but they vary a little bit. And you obviously wear PPE as you're doing that and dispose of them properly. Ah, okay. So it's not a, not uh, not at the end of every session, for example. No, certainly not. No, they're, they're yeah. long long life. The uh, information I saw today, some of the manufacturers have a recommendation around the volume of air being passed through them, uh, and some of them are date and time. So it kind of depends. Thanks, John. Yeah. I've got two well, questions. An interesting that... point. Sorry, it came up was that uh, if, if you happen to have someone with COVID in your surgery, the only way that your surgery is not going to be closed, well, it'll probably be closed for deep cleaning, but the only way that every single staff member is not going to be isolated as a close contact is if they're wearing full PPE, eyewear and, and a P2 mask. And with their current epidemiological risk, there's going to be someone with COVID walking through your door soon. Yeah, it's a shift from personal protection to sort of maximising your chance of being able to stay at work, really, isn't it? Mm. There's, a, there's, a dif there's a difference in that interpretation. Um, we have a few uh, um, health system capacity questions that I'm not sure we're going to be able to answer, but I will put them to the panel anyway, see where we can go, from Dr Anna Kelly. Hello, Anna. What plans for workforce if contact of contact shut down is can we get rapid testing for healthcare workers? And she has a second question. Any plans for local respiratory clinics like Raymond Terrace? Yeah, so the rapid testing uh, is really in the mix at the moment. So Pathology New South Wales, I know are doing an evaluation of available tests. RCPA have come out with a statement. TGA are sort of thinking about this as well. So I think there'll be news on rapid testing soon. I think that it's it makes a lot of sense to me with a, a virus that has high load, that is, the rapid tests are likely to be quite sensitive and um, provide some assurance if they're negative, particularly if they're done multiple times um, on, on staff. Um, so some Sydney hospitals are already doing um, testing of staff, but um, that's being done with PCR. Um, we haven't haven't hasn't been brought in elsewhere. We're sort of waiting on high for, for that. I don't think we're at at that stage. I might jump in at this stage with regard to the question about whether if there are any plans to open up a respiratory clinic similar to the Raymond Terrace one. If you would like to explore the possibility of a GP VMO position in such a respiratory clinic, please get in touch with me in the next 24 to 48 hours. Um, you can email me at lee.fong, that's L -E -E dot F O N G at health.nsw.gov.au. Plug finished. <laughs> nice one, Lee. <laughs> mm, I might jump in on the rapid testing. I mean, one thing that we really struggle with was getting testing and obviously not rapid testing here, we're just talking about getting PCR tests back in a timely fashion. And I'd really recommend that um, practices work out how they're going to do tests when they have an exposure and that they talk to their local pathologist, the, the pathologist that they have the best relationship with and say, how can we get these ones put on an overnight run? Um, that, that if we had have had to close 20 staff off until we tested negative for 48 hours during a week, that would have been a major upheaval to patient care, to cash flow, to the whole lot. So I'd, I'd really encourage you to explore how you're going to do your tests quickly. Thanks, yes, Colin. And we've, we've, we've put that in place for us so that we've, we've made sure that people have access to swabs. And, um, you know, everyone's taken a swab. Everyone has a swab at home in case. And we have a plan for getting those tested. So I think it's going to be different individual circumstances, isn't it, as you say? Hmm. We are rapidly getting to the end of our time, panellists. Um, can someone please tell Mark Foster whether he needs to shave his beard off before we leave? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, on a, <laughs> and on a more serious note, uh, please uh, don't be... Um, 
disillusioned if your question hasn't been directly answered tonight. What we will do is circulate the questions to the panellists and we will endeavour to get the answers for you and then we'll collate those and circulate them. So please don't feel frustrated if you haven't had your question answered this evening. Uh, we've had a record number of people uh, attend and ask questions. Um, so I'd just like to take this opportunity to thank our panellists, um, Michelle, Joanne, Lee, John Ferguson and Colin Pearce, very much appreciated as always and uh, thanks for your time. Charles, over to you. Thanks, John. Thank you everyone for sending in all those questions. That was a great discussion and we're really lucky to have um, all these experts on the panel sharing their insights and their knowledge and their experience. Um, so of course, yes, thank you, Michelle, Joe, Lee, both Johns as well, and Colin uh, for joining us. And I also appreciate you've taken the time to prepare for tonight in your busy schedule, so thank you. Um, as I mentioned at the start, the session is being recorded, so uh, the recording will become available from tomorrow morning in our PHN Education Library. So if you'd like to re-watch or let colleagues know that may have missed it tonight. Um, there'll also be a short evaluation survey that will pop up uh, when the webinar ends. If you could take a moment to fill that out, we really appreciate your feedback. So thanks again, everyone, for joining us, and we hope you have a great evening. Good night. Good night. Thank you. <laughs>